Uh, kia ora everyone, now am I. Uh, my name's Timothy and today we're going to kick things off by learning about the way that stereotypes and tropes develop and how some of these things, like uh, the noble savage in particular, escape the games and movies they appear in and uh, have a very real effect on the way that we perceive people, but also how we decide these, we want these characters to perceive, be perceived within the media that we create. So, all right. There we go. <laughs> cool. So to start at the bottom, a stereotype is like a, a formulaic or conventional idea about something or someone, whereas a trope is kind of like a stereotype that's common to a particular kind of media. So when we're talking about, say, for example, a person that comes from a particular background, the way that that person is thought of could be a stereotype whereas the way that it is incorporated into a form of fiction would be a trope. For instance, a well-known character would, a well-known example would be a character like Apu from The Simpsons. He's depicted as a corny stereotype of an Indian middle-aged guy who owns a convenience store in Springfield. Yeah, uh, so that's a stereotype, but the fact that Southern Asian people are often represented as owning or working in convenience stores in film and television, that part is a trope. Uh, so this has been something that's been present in games, books, storytelling since all these things began. We're talking magic swords, lost civilizations, love triangles, evil step-parents. These are all different genre tropes. Uh, and then for stereotypes, we get the Italian gangster, the vacant blonde, the Irish drunk, and so forth. Now, tropes and stereotypes don't spring up out of nowhere. They often develop naturally based on our observations. Our brains kind of create a sort of shorthand. Like, uh, I've seen a lot of bank robbers wearing stripy shirts. Therefore, if I see someone wearing a stripy shirt, I can assume they're a bank robber, uh, which is an actually totally untrue stereotype. They could be French. <laughs> um, one concept in particular that I spend a lot of time uh, kind of going on and on about is both a stereotype and a trope, uh, which we call the noble savage. Uh, so this is an idea that seems largely from the writings of dudes like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who when witnessing what he felt was an age of alienation and degeneracy caused by the increasing industrialization and development of the big European cities of the time, he felt that humans were in their most pure and carefree form when closest to their natural state. Now, this is before Marx and Engels identified that this alienation people were feeling was actually a symptom of the emergence of the new class society and people becoming estranged from the products of their labor. Instead, these early ideas of the noble savage naively focused on the cultures that these Europeans fetishized as simpler for being allegedly more pure and closer to their natural state. So, over time, this kind of morphed and joined with other narratives, particularly the kind of warrior race, scary native trope we picked up from old cowboy movies and the like, which is in itself a way to portray stories about colonization and imperialism through a lens more sympathetic to the white settlers than the natives. It's much easier to justify a cowboy taking down a bunch of natives on horseback or to have a handsome hero raid a, for, a temple for sacred artifacts if you reduce the rightful inhabitants and owners to basically person person-sized goblins in face paint. So, and so as we've seen with examples like Apu from The Simpsons, these things don't exist just inside a bubble of the media that they were created in. They may be initially created based on a reductive real life observation, but then popular media, pick, media picks them up and intensifies them, creating catchphrases like, thank you, come again, and literally anything an Asian character ever said on South Park. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has probably heard or even taken part in some kind of schoolyard mimicry of some pretty racist characterizations from these shows. And uh, this happens with the noble savage and the warrior race too. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with the warrior gene discourse that had a hot moment back in the day where people literally argued that Maori and Pacifica people had some kind of genetic predisposition towards warrior-like activity. For instance, starting fights, playing rugby, and joining gangs. A theory that was actually championed by researchers down here at the Victoria University of Wellington, who based on the minuscule sample size of 46 Maori men, declared in the New Zealand Medical Journal that Maori were just born to be warriors, 
which is funny because in their own study, Chinese men actually scored far higher, but they weren't marked as a warrior race, presumably because of other far more prevalent racial stereotypes. Now, some of you might be thinking this is all in the past, but this was published right here in this city in 2007. It's just over a decade ago. Even though these and other adjacent papers have gone on to be discredited, the only reason they really took hold was because people already felt them to be true. There was a confirmation bias here. It, it's a convenient one. The idea of certain groups that are being more predisposed to crime or less inclined towards academic pursuits really hope, helps when you look at things like crime and punishment statistics. For example, Maori women being the most imprisoned demographic in the world. It's a lot easier to blame this on a warrior gene than to actually discuss uh, subjects like poverty, intergenerational trauma, and the over-policing of marginalized communities. So, and it's not like these things just stay in the halls of academia either. The warrior gene was talked about on the cover of newspapers, the evening news, Paul Holmes did a segment on it. It was beamed into the living rooms of people all over the country, literal skull measuring scientific racism presented as a fact without any real examination of the methodology at all. There are talkback radio people out there today that still think it's real because they saw it on the news once 15 years ago. And so from the labs to the living rooms to the schoolyard it went. I vividly remember getting in a fight in high school and hearing my teacher say to the deputy principal, he's part Maori, you know, warrior genes, which is wild because I remember nailing it in horticulture class as well, but I never once heard, he's part Maori, you know, agricultural genes. <laughs> and this works in the opposite direction too, uh, with the myth of the model minority, which suggests that certain minorities are different than others, but in a good way, uh, which is just a different flavor of racism that lets you ignore a whole raft of, of socioeconomic factors. And I know these just sound like minor misconceptions or whatever, but these stereotypes actually shape the way people view the world and then go to inform everything from minor social interactions all the way up to government policy decisions. On top of all this, stereotypes like the noble savage, especially in historic themed media, often help to revise the very real histories of the people represented into a more palatable and homogenized product to, to mainstream audiences. And in the same way, the cowboy movies and games often promote a reductive view of the natives to make them easier targets. The reality is that many countries around the world have employed these same stereotypes against their own native populations to downplay or ignore the violence necessary for colonization. So this is the part where we get into the practical stuff. What do we do about all of this? As media creators, game developers, how do we get the best, uh, how do we do the best we can do around all of this? It's hard, right? Video games rely on conveying a lot about characters through their visuals. And stereotypes can act as a visual shorthand. And many cultural signifiers have been absorbed into this visual language. Like Tamoko and other indigenous facial tattooing, for instance. If you see someone in a game with tattoos like this, you just know they're gonna be a warrior. Like, you just know it. It's, it's lazy, and uh, we see it over and over again. So does that mean we just have to throw out all the stereotypes and tropes and try to create 100% original ideas e every single time? I mean, it is worthwhile, particularly for development teams, to question some of the visual shorthand they use. Like, if you're creating a native culture for your game, instead of transposing Native Americans or Maori into this new environment, maybe consider how cultures develop to reflect their environment and then think about the environment that you're creating and how that might, might shape a culture in other ways. But also, there is a space between where you can use stereotypes and tropes to create an expectation with the player and then subvert it, which then, when done well is actually a great way of making people examine their own biases. Some of the greatest stories in games derive their best moments from subverting the real-life expectations of the players. Games like 80 Days and Disco Elysium do this constantly to great effect. The challenge is building a situation that will elicit those initial expectations without actually leaning into them yourself. And often this line is crossed because people are attempting to depict an experience that's not their own. So they go too hard on the stereotypes and end up creating something indistinguishable from a racist minstrel show. So, if you're trying to create, write a story that involves a character from a certain background, you should be, at the very least, consulting with someone from that background. Otherwise, you'll end up with something like Greedful. 
uh, which even though the narrative does have some naive pro-indigenous commentary, is completely tone deaf in the way that they appropriated moko kanoi, traditional Maori facial tattooing. These devs ignored feedback from many prominent Maori commentators and cultural advisors about the theft of this taonga, and then they published a game about foreigners coming to an island and stealing from the natives with absolutely no self-awareness. So, great job, guys. So, what do you do if you can't find anyone from the group you wish to represent to consult on your project? Uh, maybe step, step back and consider if it's absolutely necessary that the character is that way. I know that kind of seems like I'm saying you should only write characters from your own perspective, but I wouldn't go that far if you're writing a story about the crew of a space station and one of the crew members is Maori, but it's not really a plot point, he's just the dude in space chilling, then that's probably gonna be fine. But if you're writing a story where the main character is Maori and her culture informs the way that she moves through the world, then you really need to be thinking about whether you're genu genuinely looking for a Maori character or you're just projecting your own idea of what you think a Maori character should be. And this goes for everyone, whether it's race, culture, religion, or gender identity. So that is the difference between Firaxis collaborating with the Māori New Zealand Arts and Crafts Institute on Civilization VI to create one of the most nuanced depictions of Māori we've ever seen in the game. And the team at Game Labs, who when receiving criticism from Native Americans on their brand new noble savage simulator, This Land is My Land, uh, opted to insult and block the people they were allegedly so inspired by in the first place, making it very clear that their interests lay with the commodified Johnny Depp Lone Ranger version of the Native American, which is as manufactured by Hollywood Studios as Mickey Mouse or Nicolas Cage, rather than the many Native Americans <laughs> still dealing with the horrific actions of the American state that this land is my land seeks to condemn on its surface. One thing it's important to remember is that although diverse characters are good, if the people you're trying to represent don't feel good about what you're doing, who is it for? Representation is supposed to make people feel like they've been seen and they're a part of something, but a flawed representation will make you feel like a cardboard cutout, like people are only perceiving you through a narrow lens. And even worse, if the only people you can relate to are even on even a purely aesthetic level are tagged as villains, mindless savages, or one-note NPCs, what kind of message do you think that sends to your audience? Moving beyond dated and offensive stereotypes means more than just changing the skin tone of a few NPCs or adding a codex entry that insinuates a character as trans. Not that you should stop doing those things, but real representation comes from more than just ticking off boxes. It comes from actively pushing for more diversity in the game development industry. There's this myth that games are created with white dudes in mind because they represent the, the average gamer, but this isn't really true. The, there's a pretty even spread across all genders and ethnic groups that stays relatively consistent even across different age groups. On the other hand, game developers skew pretty heavily towards being white and male which isn't an indictment of white dudes or anything, it's just the reality that there are, on average, there are on average fewer material barriers to overcome to gain access to a career in games if you're part of the group most catered to by Western hegemony. You can't really just sit around and act like the industry lacks diverse voices because minorities don't want to be involved. If you want to see changes, you have to actively work to make the industry accessible for everyone, which could mean anything from making sure your games aren't alienating people by employing harmful stereotypes to making sure that everyone gets paid what they're worth so that typically underpaid people like women can actually afford to stay in the industry long term and take on senior roles. Cool, even though you can learn to spot these elements in your games and still create them with diverse casts of characters that draw from different cultures and experiences, it's all kind of performative if we're not addressing those same issues in real life too. You shouldn't be engaging with these discussions in your games purely as a response to the market. You should do it because you believe in what you're doing and the games that you're making. That's how you create meaningful experiences that will stick with people long after they're finished. And that's how we should once and for all put the noble savage and all these stereotypes to bed. Thanks. Backstage and hearing the, the crowd response as you started to go through the statistics from the academic research and how recent all of that is is kind of horrifying. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's wild because like I remember it when I was a kid. I remember watching poems with my parents and being like, 
that's weird. But there was also this like kind of thing where you're a kid and you don't really understand it and you're just like, warrior race, badass. But then when you like grow <laughs> up and you're just like, oh, actually, no, that kind of sucks. <laughs> Maybe not as cool as it sounds in practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, I, I feel like my initial idea of being like, oh, yeah, warrior your race is sick is because I was, um, I guess, conditioned by playing video games and role-playing games and things where they're like, oh, yeah, orcs are a warrior race. And I was like, yeah, orcs are cool. I want to be tough. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you've got any questions, feel free to fire them through on the hashtag and I'll uh, keep an eye out for them. I promise I'm not just being rude and like scrolling through my tablet. I'm looking for your questions. But in the just meantime, checking Twitter. oh, yeah, yeah, no, as you do <laughs> on the stage. Um, so much of the onus of emotional labor of telling indigenous stories gets put onto indigenous people to do. How do we facilitate people telling their own stories while not making it their sole responsibility to, oh, you're the indigenous person, you tell the indigenous story? Yeah, I think it. Um, I think it is giving people agency over the stories they want to tell. Like, um, we were actually talking about this the other night. The idea that um, every, like, every story you create has to be an educational experience, which is cool. And a lot of people that is their focus when they're you know creating things. They're like, I want to teach someone about like Te Ao Maori or whatever like that. But um, we saw what we were talking about the other day was um, the TV show The Deadlands, which came out recently, which is just kind of like this really cheesy. Um, Maori action series with like zombies and stuff and um, a lot of people were like oh this is kind of weird because it's not really teaching anybody about you know like te ao Maori or anything like that but it's like but sometimes you just want to have like zombies and Maori <laughs> and <laughs> smashing you know like it's, it's that kind of thing and it's like um, you know like it, it's I think it's attitudes like that that have uh, traditionally kind of kept um, yeah like minorities out of like genre fiction and things like that because it's like you know kind of they get relegated to like an educational kind of thing or like getting stuck doing like historic fiction or something like that you know but um yeah I think like the main thing is just getting people like giving people agency over the stories they want to tell and also just um yeah paying them for it Paying them for it's yeah, really yeah, important. Like, um, <laughs> there's been a couple times where I've had like, you know, threads blow up on Twitter or whatever like that. And then I just get like my inbox is full of people being like, hey, I'm doing this. Can you tell me what I need to do? Or hey, I'm doing a comic. Can you design the or something like that? And it's just like, you know, every single one of them, like when you say like, okay, cool. Well, these are my rates or whatever like that. It's just like dot, 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 dot. So <laughs> now they just stay in the message requests. <laughs> On the topic of paying people for their labor, yeah. for people who do need to pay someone for their labor to, yeah. uh, I guess, cultural sensitivity, read yeah. a, a project, are there any organizations or, or people like yourself who you could recommend for that service? Um, yeah, there are there are um, groups around. Uh, it tends to be like a lot of freelancers and stuff, though. Um, I mean, it's yeah, depending on what you're looking for. Usually, um, heading to Twitter is a good spot because there's a lot of, a lot of people in that area, kind of. Uh, you know, like on Twitter quite a bit or whatever. But um, yeah, I would, I kind of, I feel like it's a little bit weird because every time someone has hit me up or someone that I know about, you know, like giving a read through for cultural sensitivity, it's already like, they've already decided what their game is about and all this kind of thing. Whereas I always feel like, if you're gonna ask me this, you gotta be prepared for me to say like, actually no, like I don't think like what you're doing is appropriate. And like the way that you have set up your story hinges on things that I just, you know, I don't think should be there or whatever. Because, you know, people get really personal about it and they're kind of like, oh, well, I'm going to do it anyway. It's like, well, you know, why did you get me involved? It's kind of better just to have, like, if you want to make a game about Native Americans, have Native Americans involved from the start, mm. you know? Um, and that way you're going to, you know, you're going to save time and everything like that because before these issues come up, it's going to, you know. It's, it's going to be addressed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's exactly like Hannah was talking about in her talk yesterday about doing regular reviews and seeking yeah, feedback yeah. early. You could have avoided this like game-breaking cultural issue. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. You yeah, yeah. seeked advice earlier. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And I mean, I think that's like kind of ties into what I was talking about mm -hmm. how um, a lot more diversity in game development will actually lead to more diverse stories being told. So, yeah. Totally. Um, I've got a question from the audience here. How would you recommend someone who is exploring their own cultural history through game design can make sure that they aren't caught up in stereotypes and tropes? Are there any resources you can recommend? Ooh, resources. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's hard to recommend um, specific resources because I think that like that's totally a thing and it's like, 
you know, something that many friends have done, even myself, like through art and things like that's, you know, like, I guess how you make sense of the world by, you know, creating art to explore, you know, well, I mean, as an artist, a creative person, you're creating art to um, explore your identity and your experiences in the world and stuff. Um, I would say, yeah, and it, it, especially if you are someone that is estranged from the culture that you grew up in or something like that, where it's like you might just see you know, like the corny stuff in the cowboy movies or whatever. And you'd be like, that's me, you know? And it's hard without any like really positive mm. representation to kind of find something to identify with. Um, yeah, I would say, um, I mean, like, I, yeah, it, it's hard to say because that's uh, such a broad thing, but I would say for all, for Maori, it would be to kind of actually, um, I guess like, I mean, return to the murai in a sense of actually looking into your own personal history and the stories of the people that come from where you come from and all that kind of thing. And you're going to get a much more relevant idea of, uh, you know, like, I guess your, your culture and your heritage and who you are from that. And it's, you know, like that can be hard to find as well because, you know, there's all kinds of like things you have to navigate there. But um, yeah, I would say stay away from just like the general ideas of what, you know, like a culture is or what a person is and look for more like specific actual things that have happened and actual people that exist and things like that. Drawing on real experiences is always going to feel more authentic and genuine. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And it can be tempted, and, uh, you know, like yeah, it's, it, it can be a lot of work. So you can be tempted to just be like, oh, no, I just want to go for the really like vague nebulous concept of maori or whatever like that you know but uh, yeah i don't think that's gonna do you well in like the long term no well, on a on a relevant note to that another question do you think breaking breaking players established expectations of a culture can create more interesting games or even be used to teach cultural awareness even when it is the zombie apocalypse with maori <laughs> yeah yeah and i think there are like you know, there are interesting questions. Like um, one of the things I talked about in there, one of the examples was like, you know, if you're going to make a game about space and there's like, you know, a Maori character on there. There's, um, that was actually based on um, a, a friend of mine who um, uh, he got an email from a dude writing a comic book that was like, hey, I'm writing this comic book about this uh, Maori woman on a space station and, um, you know, like, I want you to design her moko and everything like that. And um, he asked for the story and all this kind of stuff. And the dude sent him this, like, really bizarre draft where it was, like, there was absolutely nothing in this that mentioned her identity or, you know, anything like that. And uh, it was kind of, like, this awkward thing where it was, like, okay, well, you just want to, like, you know, you just want to put someone with cool facial tattoos in your story or whatever like that. Whereas it's, like... I feel like there is a really compelling story to be t told about, you know, like a Maori person on a spa on a satellite that is like feeling estranged from their whenua mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, there's like there is genuinely a lot of stuff to explore there. But I wouldn't trust guys like that to tell a story that I would actually be interested in reading. You get what I mean? <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah, yeah. There is um, there's a lot of cool stuff to explore and like, you know, genre work and whether it's zombies or space stations and all that kind of things. And, you know, like, what does it mean? Like, what is, um, what do, like, how are Maori funeral rites impacted by the dead returning to life and things like that? And it's like, you know, like there's, there are interesting stories to be told there. I want to play that game. That sounds <laughs> fascinating <laughs> as hell. <laughs> Um, on an, uh, we're getting a really good run of questions that are um, related to each other, which is quite cool. cool. Someone, someone has asked, um, do you think there's a level of representation depth that games should get past before including representation like cyberpunk throwing in the tattoos rather than actually going that step further? Yeah, um, it is. It's interesting because, like, yeah, I feel like... Um, there's there's different levels of representation right you know like there's including people with different skin tones and stuff which is cool because it's like you know then people kind of can see themselves something that represents themselves especially in like character creators and things like that and just npcs wandering around but i feel like when you are including specific things like in cyberpunk and the character creator that was like moko kowai which was mm -hmm. like a character creation option but then like that is something that is like quintessentially maori you know it's like not as kind of like you know like a different skin tone could be like many different kinds of races or anything like that but this thing is like quintessentially maori and it can't be like it's not siloable from te ao maori it's like it's it's part of it and it's all connected you know so it's kind of weird to 
include things like that and like that that's not representation to me that's just like something that's just been picked off or whatever it's tokenism so, yeah 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 exactly you know and i mean to me to me it kind of seems like they just probably just googled like facial tats <laughs> or something and they were like this one's cool and they probably have no idea that you know about the history or anything mm. or like you know that these things actually are a visual language and it says something and so, so you know yeah. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one more question, but uh, um, a on a, I, th I think it's a good one. It's maybe not an easy one, but is a valuable one. Yeah, okay. um, do you have any advice for marginalized developers who often have to out ourselves as whatever marginalization we are to push back on bad practices when we don't necessarily want to be known as the Jewish dev, the dev with cancer, the dev with a mental disability, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is a tricky one because I've seen this uh, a lot with people that are content creators like um, game developers, writers, and everything who, you know, like um, uh, there was like uh, an author, Isabel Fall, who wrote a short story about, um, it was kind of like navigating trans identity issues and stuff. And um, uh, she got a lot of pushback and had to like kind of, she intentionally didn't keep a lot of information about who she was online, but because of the pushback, she had to actually kind of out herself in a very public way. And it was like a very traumatic experience for everyone involved. So I think that there is a thing where it's like, you know, if you do come from like some kind of like marginalized identity, you, you there are things you have to navigate that other people might not, you know, like there's things you have to think about. And I think like the only way that, like the only way to actually get support in that is by forming real bonds in real community, whether that's like online or in person and stuff, just having a really good support network around you. And um, if, if it's in a workplace, like, you know, at a developer or something like that, having people around you that you can trust and be like, hey, look, I'm gonna have this discussion or whatever like that. Um, you know, like, I'd like to know that you guys will support me, you know, if I'm gonna go to our bosses and I'm gonna say this or, you know, something like that. Like, um, you know, and that doesn't have to be anything as big as a union, even though, you know, union's great. Ooh. But, um, you know, just on a small scale, just having a tight knit group of people. And yeah, I mean, if you're just an indie developer or something like that, even just like an online community, mm -hmm. like a Discord or something like that, where, you know, and you can talk to people beforehand and be like, hey, should, do you think I should, do this right now or is this you know and also like recognizing your own limitations of the actual kind of like the energy and where your mental health is at and stuff and being like okay do i need to do this right this moment or should i maybe just wait until you know things have chilled down in my private life my work life and then i can do this or whatever because um yeah that's like the thing as well like you can do something that is amazing you can put out your great piece of art but just because the way that the world is it will take off a toll on you, you know, like, so yeah, just be careful and uh, take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Taking care of yourself is really important. It's so easy to burn out because everything feels urgent and sometimes you do have to pick your battles, which is not fair. Yeah. But it makes a lot of uh, difference when protecting yourself. <laughs> sure. um, I've got one last comment just quickly before we wrap this up. Um, Yaron just wanted to say, not a statement, uh, just a statement, not a question, but Timothy, this talk was real king shit. So thank you. <laughs> Timothy, thank you. Got it. <laughs>